Okay, back in 1972, a friend of mine brought over this game, 1812, The Campaign of Napoleon in Russia by SPI. And from that day forward, I've been interested in the Emperor Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars in general. Now that same year, they came out with this game, The Battle of Borodino by SPI again. And we played this thing to death. I was in my college years by then, but uh, that didn't stop us from practically wearing out the counters playing this one. We played it scores of times. We fast forward now to 1975, and Marshall Enterprises released their monumental La Bataille de la Mascova, which is a regimental battalion level game on the Battle of Borodino. It's my recollection, I think we played it twice. We played the Shevardino scenario out to the end. We attempted the Grand Battle game, but we never finished it. Later on, um, GGW re-released the game in a much better edition. And I think I ended up buying that one. Again, we ended up playing just the Shevardino redoubt scenario, never taking on the Grand Battle game. And for the 200th anniversary in 2012, Clash of Arms released this magnificent um, anniversary edition. Uh, it lies on my shelf, unplayed and unpunched. I doubt if I will ever play it. Now, I do a lot of reading, of course, and uh, if you're into the Napoleonic Wars, you can't go wrong by getting this military atlas of the Napoleonic Wars. It's a magnificent book. Uh, tons of maps and colors of the campaigns, the battles. It's uh, an incredible book. Very good for a war game or two to have. I purchased lots of books on Napoleon, of course, and more specifically, the campaign in Russia. Uh, I'm actually buying them faster than I can read them. But uh, I read this one, profusely illustrated, the memoirs of Albrecht Adam. Uh, Michael Adams, Napoleon in Russia. I'm actually currently reading this one, The Battle of Borodino, by Alexander Mikabirdze, and he's a Russian, so we're getting the Russian perspective on that battle. There's a great three-volume set by Paul Britton Austin, which I've not read yet. First volume was The March on Moscow, 1812, then uh, Napoleon in Moscow, and then finally The Great treat. And of course there's plenty of books on Napoleon himself. Um, thick ones too. This one by Adam Zamoyski is pretty comprehensive. I read that one. And uh, Philip Dwyer's Citizen Emperor. Uh, I can't get enough books on Napoleon. Each author usually teaches me something new about the man that I didn't know before. So why am I showing you all this stuff? Well, it's just to introduce you to the fact that I am interested in the uh, Napoleonic campaigns in Russia. And the game we're going to be looking at here is Nations in Arms with the specific Napoleon in Russia campaign. I've already done a couple of videos on this uh, huge Napoleonic game, uh, how to sort it. You really have to have a, an efficient sortation system if you're going to play a scenario. For example, this 1812 scenario that we're going to look at, um, it took me about an hour to set this one up. It doesn't look like much, but believe me, when you have to go through 90 different commanders to find them, it takes a while. So that's about an hour to set up. And I sorted them, I think I mentioned that in my last video, uh, alphabetically. Um, leaders. It's the only way you're going to be able to set these things up efficiently. It's a big game with lots of counters. So what I'm going to do is run through a um, playtest of the uh, campaign, and we'll see where it goes. Just a brief overview of what's going on here. Show you the uh, armies. Now, for the video, I put little wee wooden dowels below the army markers. So whenever you see a raised platform like that, that indicates an army. So these are the positions of the armies as they were in the spring of 1812. More or less, you've got the Grand Army here under Napoleon. 
You've got the army of Italy under his stepson Eugene. And I think that's Ney, no, that's Grouchy's army of um, Germany. Schwarzenberg, Austrian, is on Napoleon's right flank. And up here you've got MacDonald on his left. Now the British, uh, the British, the Russians, you've got um, Barclay's first army and Bogorachin's second army, and that's Constantine. Now Napoleon's plan was to rush in against Barclay and cut him off from Bagration and crush Bagration. But uh, this army under Grouchy, or his brother Jerome, I think, uh, moved a little slow, and uh, the opening of the campaign didn't quite go the way Napoleon wanted. Usually what Napoleon did was strike fast, destroy the enemy's army, and then he wouldn't have to go into the interior of the country. But it uh, didn't turn out that way. Now, turn one of any scenario or game is usually pretty critical, and this one's no different. Now, I was fooling around with it, because in this game, you don't know who's going to go first. You roll for initiative. And in one of the tests I did, Napoleon got to go first, and he attacked Barclay here, and Barclay failed to avoid, and Barclay was pretty chewed up wasn't a good opening for the Russians. So I reset it up and uh, as I play it I'll photograph it and we'll see where it goes. And um, I think the Russians have got to fall back in the initial stages because the Grand Army is just too big. That consists of 11 core. Now I'm going to be using the off-board boxes too and I'll photograph the uh, game probably after every um, movement phase. This is just an experiment. I don't know how it's going to go. I may have to chuck this whole video if it doesn't work. I just like this scenario and uh, give you an idea of what this game is all about and how to play it. Now I'll be zooming in on the action soon. I won't use these far shots because it's a little hard to see. But uh, I'll zoom in closer. You won't see the whole map. but you should be able to see the action. You can see the outlying forces here. Victor's way in the rear. Up here is St. Petersburg. Way over here is Moscow. And that's Smolensk. That's Kiev and Poland and Austria where Schwarzenberg is. So let's begin this playthrough. Okay, the game begins with the French having the initiative. And as part of the turn one conditions, they must start with the Empire Land 4 chit, which means that any leader that has an initiative of 4 or greater can move, which also means that Napoleon can move. So logically, Napoleon will move, and he'll try to bring Barclay's first army to bear. Of course, Barclay's not going to want to fight 11 Corps of the Grand Army, so we'll probably see some withdrawals. And if Barclay fails to withdraw, we'll probably have a big battle on the frontiers of the Russian province and, um, or Polish province, rather. And that's not too good for the Russians. So a lot depends on the avoidance role of Barclay. Let's get Napoleon moving first. Okay, movement in this game is six movement. Napoleon has a bridge unit with him. So he can cross here at no cost, because he has a bridge, which I'll leave in the hex. So Napoleon's Grand Army will move here for one movement point, and for his second movement point, he'll move into the Vilna Square. Spending two movements of his six. Now Barclay has the chance to avoid and he needs to roll 10 or greater on two dice with the appropriate modifiers. I'll check the modifiers, and let's see if Barclay successfully avoids Napoleon. So we've looked at the modifiers, and the final modifier is plus two, because uh, you take into account the leader's initiative, and the initiative from the enemy leader, there's Napoleon, 
Um, Barclay has light cavalry present, which gives him plus one. And he's got a cavalry leader, which gives him uh, plus one. So in the end, he's got plus two. And he needs to roll 10 or greater. So I'll roll, see what we get. Well, as I suspected, I suspected this would happen. He does not fall back. That means we're gonna have a battle right at the frontiers of the borders of Poland. And that doesn't bode very well for the Russians. So I'll do all the combat modifiers and we'll see how that combat turns out. So that's Napoleon's dream and Barclay's nightmare. Now there are nine distinct steps in combat. And one of the first things to do is mark the battle square with this contact marker. Just to remind yourself where the battle is should you take the units off the board. Now I'm not going to go into detail in these nine distinct steps, but I'll mention them in passing as I calculate how we do the combat. In step one, you check to see if there's any marching to the sound of the guns. That would occur if there was any other forces adjacent to the contact X. You could roll to see if other units would march to the battle. In this case, there are none. We now check the morale of each army, and uh, we do that by counting the number of corps that have the highest morale. And let's take a look at Napoleon's Grand Army. Okay, that's the composition of the Grand Army. The morale is the third number, so the most... Uh, he's got four corps with a morale of four, so the morale of Napoleon's army will be four. How many corps has he got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine core. That's pretty formidable. Barclay's army has five core, and his morale is four. So they're going to cancel each other out. Give you a formula for drawing tactical cards. But in the end, Napoleon gets five cards, and Barclay gets three. Napoleon draws unexpected ditch, horse artillery, rear guard, refused flank, Cossacks. Barclay gets panic, square, or grand charge. Each commander is allowed to pick one card unless his combat value is two or more. In this case, it's only Napoleon. So Napoleon, if he wishes to, can use two cards. Barclay can use one. Now the disadvantage of using a second card is one, you have to have a subordinate leader, no problem for Napoleon. But if you do use that second leader, he's got to be the first casualty to check if there is step losses. So you have to do a leader check. So there's a cost for everything, which is kind of neat. There's more decision making. I'll go through the cards and decide which is the best one for Napoleon to pick. Okay, it wasn't a great selection, but uh, Napoleon will choose horse, horse artillery. Uh, he does qualify because he has, does have two supplied cavalry corps. So we'll be adding plus one to his die roll. And Barclay chooses to use this one. It's the only good card he had. He adds one to the enemy die roll when they do a morale check. We'll continue on to the next step. Now in this case, there will not be any modifier for the strength ratio because Napoleon more or less has 18 to 10, which is... Uh, one to one. So no modifier there. But there might be other modifiers which we'll get to having to do with cavalry and artillery. Okay, Napoleon has 10 factors of artillery. Barclay has five. So the French are going to be adding plus two to their die roll. Not looking too good for Barclay right now. Okay, this isn't going to be good at all because the French have four cavalry steps. Barclay has two. That means they get another plus two for cavalry superiority. Terrain isn't coming into play because it's taking place in open terrain. Now each side chooses their assault unit, a lead unit, and um, by picking the lead unit, that's the unit that will take the casualties when casualty time comes. Okay, after doing all the calculations, French are going to have plus eight 
plus that horse artillery, they're going to have plus nine to the dice. So um, I don't think Barkley is going to come out of this too good, which is a little bit of a cautionary note for me for the opening of the scenario. We know the Russians fell back in good order, and if the whole campaign is going to be decided on turn one with a major battle, which could have happened, um, I'm a little disappointed in the scenario, you might say. But let's see what the combat is like and what the casualties are like after we roll the die. Okay, in this combat system, both players roll the dice. Remember, we're adding nine to Napoleon. And let's see what the final result is. What I should point out, that because we have how many steps now? I said um, maybe it isn't a major battle. Maybe it'll be a minor battle. Let me just check the steps. Oh, yeah. It's a major battle because they have 21 steps. So this could be ugly or maybe it won't be. Let's find out. Rolling the die. And it's a 9, plus 9, so we have an 18 result. Okay, now we roll for Barkley. He gets a 9 result. Let's see what that's all about. Okay, as I suspected, it's a horrible result for Barkley. Napoleon got a 7CL result, which means Barkley loses 7 steps, one of which must be cavalry, and he must do a leader check. Napoleon is going to lose three steps. But remember, he has to do a leader check too for his first corps because he used that... Um, or did he? No, he didn't use the core. All right, still, it's bad enough. Three step losses. So that probably wipes out Barkley's army. Let me do the casualties and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, it was bad, but not as bad as I thought. Seven steps really hurt Barkley. His army is down to now three steps, two infantry and the cavalry, and they're both flipped. Napoleon got hurt with uh, that first corps being flipped and two other, but it was a huge decisive victory. And of course, uh, Barkley's gonna have to retreat. Oh, finally, Barkley gets some good luck. He retreated two hexes up here to join Constantine's force. And by miracle, he did not get demoralized. But it's not over yet, because after you win a battle, you can keep on moving. Now, Napoleon has spent only two movement points, and he gets six. So he has four movement points left, which means he could continue on and fight again. If I know Napoleon, he probably would. Now, even though Napoleon won the battle, he's still on the... Vilna Hex, which means he has to lay siege to it. Now, because he won a battle, he can actually do it, and you're going to roll on the siege table. So I'm pretty sure it'll, it'll go, but let me look at the rules, though, to see uh, what happens to good old Vilna. Okay, I've looked at the siege table here, and I don't think it's going to have much of a chance against Napoleon. It's only a fortress level one. So let me roll that and see what the result is. A poor old Vilna didn't have a chance against Napoleon. He rolled a breach, so uh, the, force, uh, the fortress is destroyed. Okay, so Napoleon actually still has four movement points. So he will move on to Barclay's army, and Barclay will try to avoid again. Now, I don't know how long I've been playing this thing. I don't know how long this video is. You can see the French are having a field day here. Let's move on and see if Barclay gets to avoid. Okay, Napoleon moves on to Barclay Square and uh, he'll roll for avoidance. You can see the stacks can get pretty unwieldy here in this game, even with very few units. That's why you pretty well have to use the army boxes. Let's see what he rolls. It's gonna be close. I'm gonna check the modifiers. As luck would have it, Barkley fails again. So we've got another potential battle there. And uh, I'll shorten this one up by doing all the modifiers, rolling the dice, and see what the battle result is. Okay, we've done all the calculations. This time the 
Russians fared off a little bit better. They got a tactical advantage over Napoleon. He got to reduce his combat value by one. But the Napoleon's forces still have more artillery and more cavalry. Net effect is the French are going to be rolling plus four. Russians are going to be adding plus one. And it's another large battle. Let's see how this goes. Okay. Barclay did a lot better in that battle. He got a two plus result against Napoleon and Napoleon got a three plus result. So Napoleon did win the battle, but it was a lot uh, closer. We'll take the casualties and do the retreats. Okay, some more good news for Barclay. He rolled for demoralization and was not demoralized. So he withdrew in good order across the Divina here. Now I'm gonna do a, an evaluation of the scenario now, what my gut feeling is because the scenario is not going the way I thought it would. Some of the die rolls there and the non-withdrawals have really affected the opening. Let me do an evaluation and uh, we'll see if we will continue. Okay, after that holocaust of a move, I've looked at the Grand Army. It's banged up, but it's still got 12 steps and uh, Barclay has five. So the Russians are taking twice the losses. But they've withdrawn, and now we'd be drawing chits to see who moves next. Now, this scenario is not what I planned. I wanted to have the Russians fall back, as they did historically, so I could sort of um, kind of recreate the campaign to see what happens. But it's turning out to be quite different. I mean, Napoleon has won two great victories here, almost kind of like a, an Austerlitz in Friedland. But the Russians are far from defeated. I think they could finally rally. I think they're going to really have to be on the defensive now. And I'm going to end the video at this point, uh, call it part one. And I might continue on. Just to show you, though, a few comments on the scenarios. Um, battles, especially on turn one, can really change the nature of a scenario. So if you get decisive battles on turn one, your Russian campaign is not going to look anything like the real campaign. And so far, it is not. But I still think there's a game here. I think there's still something to explore. So with that, I'll end part one of this video, and uh, thank you for watching.